Do I have to look into the camera? Yeah, we, you can look at me? Good. How do I look? The way he's, you see, you are having no, your next Actually, question. ideally, to the question. You look at what? Yes, you look at us best. like this. Good, fine. Okay. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Who was the first dean of the Annenberg School? The first dean of the Annenberg School was Gilbert Seldes. Gilbert Seldes was a long-time television critic uh, who at one point wrote or was inspired uh, to write a column. Upon hearing the establishment of the Annenberg School, he wrote a column in the Saturday Review mm -hmm. where he was a, a television columnist mm -hmm. just speculating about what uh, the opportunities and the and the prospects of this new school might be. Mm -hmm. Walter Annenberg read that column, or perhaps was given that column by people who had sufficient foresight uh, to predict what might happen. He said, that's the man we want, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they appointed him dean. Uh, he had never been in a university before. He had no higher degree, uh, but he was a brilliant man with excellent ideas in the field of communications and he uh, established or helped establish the school uh, ran it for two years. This was after his retirement for several, from several other positions and he was about to retire as critic. He was well into his 60s, I don't remember the precise age. So he said I'll take it on for two years and then uh, you'll have, have to find somebody else. Uh, when he retired after two years they appointed Robert Spiller, a professor of English, historian of American literature, very distinguished individual, to be an acting dean while the search was going on. It was during that year that they interviewed a number of candidates, including myself, mm -hmm. and they offered the job to me, and I met uh, Gilbert Sel Seldes, whom I, I admired very much, and in fact I had used his work in my doctoral dissertation, mm -hmm. and we became good friends. And Gilbert said, there's one thing that I've done for you, and I, I think you should take this deanship, which is, I've done nothing permanent. You can change whatever you want. Uh, I helped establish the school, but I wanted to make sure that uh, I am not a person of higher education, that I don't leave any kind of a permanent imprint, imprint or legacy except freedom. Freedom to do uh, what you and your faculty will want to do. Uh, they certainly appreciated that advice and started to build a faculty which did not exist at that point. The uh, members of the uh, staff, none of them had faculty appointments, they were part-timers, and there was a group of university professors from other departments appointed as a faculty council, given the name of faculty council, to act as a faculty. So in effect it was outsiders a group of outsiders that acted as the faculty of the school until we were able to build a, a permanent uh, faculty within the next uh, few years, uh, eventually uh, uh, add a PhD to the, to the master's program. And we've had a very stable faculty between 10 and 12 faculty members plus a few part-timers ever since. Tell me something, uh, the, uh, the School of Education was an outshoot of a department or it was created from, from scratch? The School of Communication, communication. Uh, was, uh, there was for a brief time some thought or intention to establish a department in the college. The problem is that this was legally and fiscally impossible. The basic structure of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania is the collaboration of two independent corporations. Mm -hmm. Let me explain this because this is very important. The Annenberg School of Communications for which I speak has a dual legal and fiscal identity. One is that of a, 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 uh, an educational corporation established in the state of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, as, an, uh, as a school corporation, same as the university that is run by its own trustees and that operates a school, it's not a foundation, called the Annenberg School of Communications. Mm -hmm. Another is a graduate school of the University of Pennsylvania established by another educational corporation, namely the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. 
approved by its own trustees, that also happens to be called the Arenberg School of Communications. Mm -hmm. So this school, in effect, has two sets of trustees and two sets of administrators. Mm -hmm. You might say this is an administrative nightmare for any dean, and it could have been, but it wasn't. Uh, there were some initial problems we can, that before I came, uh, mostly misunderstandings. But basically what happens is that they set up the, a contract between the two corporations, between the Annenberg School Corporation and the University of Pennsylvania Corporation, uh, which is a contract to jointly operate a school with this dual identity. The reason uh, for this fiscal and legal arrangement is that a school uh, such as the Annenberg School or indeed the university itself is eligible to almost total income tax exemption. Now, the Annenberg family has placed stocks, bonds, securities of Triangle Corporation, which is the principal holding company of the Annenberg interests, into the school. It gave it away in perpetuity to the Annenberg School of Communications as an educational corporation. That is a very profitable set of securities, yet it is exempt from income tax. We live on that exemption. We live on the, on the difference between a school and a foundation. A foundation uh, generates or gets its monies and then it disperses it to other corporations, but it is only about 75% exempt, not almost 100% exempt. A school is almost 100% exempt, and therefore it keeps all the money that it generates and spends it on its own educational purposes. That means that the Annenberg School of Com Communications is prohibited by law from being a conduit to another corporation. Therefore, it could not finance a department in the college or in any other, other unit of the university, it had to operate a school that is directly responsive to its own trustees and make a contract with the university so that we are responsive to two sets of trustees and two sets of administrators. The way that that administrative complication is resolved is that there is a joint committee of trustees which has four members of the Annenberg School Corporation trustees, four members of the university trustees appointed by the university, the president, the provost, the dean of, dean of the school, and the secretary of the corporation ex officio. It is that body that acts for the two parent trustee groups. That body meets at least twice a year. Uh, the dean presents the budget, presents the plans of the school, presents the appointments, just like any other uh, president does to the trustees, and uh, then if that joint committee of trustees of the two corporations approves it, uh, as far as all practicality is concerned, it is done, it is approved. Legally, that constitutes a recommendation to the two parent boards, which they have always approved since the uh, principal members of the two parent boards already sit on this joint committee. That is the way that that has been resolved. This is the reason why the Annenberg School has to be a school and not a department, because it cannot be a subunit of the university. It has to be one of the top units that is responsive to the university trustees and the, and the, the Annenberg School Corporation trustees. For the president of the university, it's a somewhat uncomfortable uh, situation because no dean of the university should be responsible responsible to a group that somehow goes around the president and the provost. So that the dean has to be very careful not to play the two sides uh, against one another, but always to make sure that, that they're together, that they both are consulted, and that there is a consensus. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, as you can see, the, the, the school and its decision-making machinery would, uh, would uh, 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 go to pieces Somewhere. if you don't, if you don't creep, uh, keep the uh, two decision-making boards always in unanimity on what, uh, what is to be done. So do you know that if we, whether this type of arrangement was readily acceptable? When, uh, when this was proposed, this type of arrangement? 
Well, I wasn't, I wasn't here when it was first proposed, and I'm sure that at the university nothing is totally acceptable. There are always, uh, there are always uh, different points of view, there are always uh, uh, objections and obstacles to overcome. Uh, they, I think that the opportunity to create the school, to create the building, to create the facility, to pioneer uh, in a new and rising field, even if no one knew exactly what complications are on the way or what might happen, the opportunity to do that, the resources available to do that, uh, were so tempting and uh, were really so attractive that they decided to go for it. Um, prior to applying for the deanship here at Annenberg, what had you heard when you were at the University of Illinois? What did you heard of, had you heard of the university? Well, deans don't exactly apply for deanships. Uh, or if they do, they're not likely to be chosen. Uh, oh, I, I've, I've, I read the uh, column. I was a reader of the Saturday Review. I read the column with great interest. I read in some of the trade papers that the school was established, and uh, I heard nothing else until uh, the telephone call came. Uh, would I be willing to visit uh, and meet with the search committee? I visited here, I went back, and uh, then they arranged for a second visit, uh, at which point I must have been on some kind of a short list, because they took me to uh, uh, see uh, Ambassador, at that point, Mr. Annenberg, uh, to have a conversation with him. He asked me what my vision uh, of school or the communications field was, and I tried to explain it to him, and uh, uh, then I received the offer. Could you tell us what was that vision? Yes, my, my vision basically was that, that the reason for the existence of a school of communications today is that uh, we have experienced and are continuing to experience an industrial revolution mm -hmm. in the most uniquely human process, namely communication. That we don't know all the uh, repercussions, the consequences, and implications of this industrial revolution when the making of minds and when the cultivation of human mentalities is no longer a handicraft, uh, a face-to-face -face interpersonal process entirely. When industrial corporate procedures have a direct and immediate effect in a symbolic environment in into which children are born and in which people grow. That uh, represents uh, a major new challenge to the organization of knowledge. It requires research, it requires people who understand it, uh, people who are uh, informed about what it means for not just for specialists but for everyday living and that this is what a school of communications is here to to cultivate, to advance and uh, to uh, uh, be to some extent responsible for. So what, what are some of the steps that you start to take when you assume the deanship? When I assumed the deanship, uh, I had been, I must say, well prepared for it because my own graduate education was in effect almost in anticipation, not of being dean, but of, of being a pioneer mm -hmm. in the field. I must, I might say, I. I, in a sense, invented communications as an academic discipline. I wrote my dissertation on a similar topic. And uh, several years after I arrived here, my, uh, the professor who was the supervisor of my dissertation sent me a term paper that I wrote uh, in one of his classes, which I had completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. And that term paper was in answer to his question, what would you do if you were to become a dean of a <laughs> graduate school of communications? I had completely forgotten. I must say it wasn't exactly what I did, but because of my own interest in communication, in the theories of communication, and in the application of those theories to research and to everyday life, I was well prepared to uh, 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 simply uh, continue and implement uh, some of the ideas. The first thing I said to the staff that was assembled and to some of the part-timers is that communication to me is a serious uh, enterprise. In fact, I hope that it will come a f become a fundamental discipline. 
It's not just a crossroads of anthropologists and sociologists and psychologists and, and uh, people from education, people from economics, history, law, and so on, where they meet and talk about how we communicate. But it is a fundamental discipline, and I take it very seriously. Uh, discipline means that it's an organization of knowledge that has something to say about every human and social situation. Every human and social situation has an economic aspect, a historical aspect, a social relational aspect, uh, a uh, physical, chemical, biological aspect. These are fundamental disciplines. To the same extent, every human communication, every human social situation has a communicational aspect. And that what we need is to develop theories of what that means, of how to deal with it, and how to contribute to knowledge in that area. So I said the criterion for being a member of this faculty is that whether you come from anthropology or sociology or psychology, doesn't matter as much as how you approach your business. If you say, I'm in communications to contribute and better understand theories of social life, you belong into sociology. If you say, I'm going to take some communicational examples to work more on human behavior, you belong in psychology. Or, I'm going to focus on the communicational aspects of economic activity, you belong in economics. If, on the other hand, you say, I'm going to bring sociological insight to bear upon theories of communication, then you belong into communication. If you say, I'm going to use my training as an economist to illuminate how communication organization wor organizations work and operate, then you belong in communications. So that just as the discipline has to be taken seriously, the focus of the activity has to be within that discipline, bringing all the other insights from the other disciplines to bear upon that discipline rather than the other way around. So that there is an intellectual rationale for considering communication seriously as a discipline. There is also a very practical rationale. You can't ask for a budget unless you mean it, uh, unless you can fight for it in a competitive environment in which every other discipline says we're a fundamental discipline, we have an intellectual terrain, we have a set of theories, we have a set of methodologies, we therefore are one of the constituent parts of the organization of knowledge. So we demand attention, we need budgets, etc., etc. Now as a dean, you have to live in a competitive environment for scarce, scarce resources, but it's a competitive environment whose test is not the marketplace. And that has serious implications. It's a competitive environment whose test is the intellectual basis and your ability to articulate it and to convince other people that indeed you are a discipline. Mm -hmm. And I had to be in a position of justifying those budgets, uh, fighting for them, of making sure that the university community understands that there is an intellectual basis for the existence of this school, not just a rich man's whim to establish something that, uh, that he can be proud of. And uh, so the con these combination of circumstances, I think, have helped to uh, not only to start building the school, but also to make sure that the school is respected mm -hmm. in an institution in which intellectual justifications, mm -hmm. uh, scholarly and research needs are weighed very heavily. Tell me, how do you uh, go about engaging the services of other faculty members who are a newcomer? How, how did you? Uh, there are two steps in there. First, I looked at the existing part-timers and said, do you want to be a serious full-time academic or do you want to just part-time work here and, and uh, uh, spend your time somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, some of them said one, some of them said the other. Mm -hmm. Those who said, I want to be a full-time academic, uh, we began to uh, uh, gather together the, the usual justifications and uh, we succeeded, if they merited an appointment, we succeeded in making them full-time tenure track or tenure professors. Then we started to look around. Of course, I had been at the University of Illinois for eight years, uh, Institute of Communications Research. 
I had been at the University of Southern California. I had made a very uh, uh, intensive study of the field. I knew uh, who most productive and creative people were. I knew where they worked. Uh, I had the magnificent opportunity of being able to offer positions, to good positions for them, and then began to travel around the country, talk to, peop talk to these people that I knew and new people I met, and offer uh, appointments to them, uh, which then were justified in the usual way, as a matter of fact, uh, double the usual way because I had to sell every faculty appointment not only to the existing faculty and with each addition there were more and more serious uh, inside faculty considerations and scrutiny but also to uh, two administrations and, and two boards. Mm -hmm. Do you have in that, in that case that you have dual board that you have to do you encounter any problems when you have a you invite a faculty member on the tenure track uh, taking into consideration the problem of, of having tenure here at Penn? No, no problem. The, the general uh, policy and decision is that tenure is in the university, mm -hmm. not, in the, not in the school per se and not in the department. Mm -hmm. So that the university, the faculty, every faculty member uh, receives a dual appointment, although they don't know it, I mean they know it, but they're not particularly aware of it. Every student in the school uh, receives a dual admission, admitted by both schools. But in effect, the degree is a University of Pennsylvania degree, and tenure is in the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So should the school disappear from one day to another, it would be the university's responsibility uh, to deal with its tenured professors. And the establishing of a curriculum in a new field. Yes. How did you go about doing it? Uh, it's an incredible opportunity. Uh, I don't know of any other school uh, that could do what we have done, because in any other school there may be a new development, but it's already based on something that is existing. It's already based on sometimes on tenured professors who, uh, in a sense, precondition and predetermine the outcome. We had none of that. We had what you would call a tabula rasa, a, a, a clear slate. Uh, uh, so as soon as we had a critical mass of about four or five senior professors, senior not necessarily in age, but in rank, in experience, we said now, uh, it is now time to review and revise what we have. If you were to well, uh, the first uh, was Saul. Char Charles Hoban was the only uh, faculty member who had tenure and who remained with the school as a full-time faculty member. Uh, uh, Saul Worth came in. Then soon after that came Charles Wright, Percy Tannenbaum, Larry Gross. Uh, I think when we had uh, Hoban, Worth, Wright, Tannenbaum, and myself, uh, and when we decided to, apl uh, to, uh, to apply for a PhD, that's, that's when we needed a kind of full-fledged, well-articulated curriculum. And um, we just sat around, uh, sometimes here, sometimes at home, uh, discussing it uh, and uh, asking ourselves, now if you were, if you were to start a new uh, school, which in effect we have an opportunity to do, what would you do? What is a logical, rational and uh, relatively stable, or uh, it is to be hoped that it will be a stable organization of knowledge in this field. The three-way division of the curriculum that you still see in the, in the bulletin was established about that time, in the first four or five years, uh, which is to say uh, that the ability to communicate has three aspects. One is what we, what we call codes and modes, and that is how do you structure messages? What, what is the coding? Coding as in Morse code, but coding is there's a visual code, there is a gestural code that we're doing right now, there's a vocal coding. A code is a non-random arrangement of events and has some significance provided you learn the code, such as the language. Uh, what are the structures and how to study that? That's the first area. 
The second area is what we call communication behavior, which is how do the parties that have this code or are learning the code relate to one another. This is the behavioral part. The third has to do with systems and institutions, communication systems and institutions. And that, that has to do with what large-scale communication systems of a variety of media and variety of types uh, exist in, in, in societies and what are the institutions that are primarily in the business of producing messages. That's the third area which, has, which ranges from the historical approach to communication uh, to communicating ability uh, to uh, studies of decision making in the mass media. This is this three-way division then became a framework around which the curriculum was built. It's a loose framework. We use it for purposes of explaining as I'm doing right now. We don't apply it very rigidly. In other words, there are certain courses that straddle more than uh, more than that, that go across one area and sometimes all three. There are certain faculty members whose interests lie in the three areas. Nevertheless, the three areas uh, are a useful explanatory device. They also uh, get rid of uh, traditional ideas or preconceived ideas of what communication study is all about. And they happen to be the three areas on which a doctoral candidate is examined. So they are the framework of the doctoral uh, preliminary examination. So that courses can be grouped, faculty members for at least purposes of uh, examination can be assigned to one of the three areas and uh, this is the way we then structured the curriculum, at least in principle. In practice, what happens is that a small graduate school such as ours, whose principal objective is to train people to be professional contributors to knowledge. Mostly academics, not exclusively, but all scholars, wherever they go, they may go into industry, they, many of them go into government, some of them go into the media, they're all trained to be scholars because we believe in doing only what we do best, which means nothing that you can learn on a job. Anything that can be learned on a job, we feel is best learned on the job. We try to do things that you'd never learn on a job, no matter how long you hold the job. That's our task. And that's basically scholarship and research. So that in practice, you also build a curriculum, not as an abstraction, but as something that you try out on people. You, have, you meet people, you talk to people, you interview people, you have a faculty opening. You say, well, we need somebody in the codes and modes area. But the codes and modes area has to be embodied in a person who has to be, first of all, a talented, productive person. Now, a talented, productive person may not come in exactly the, in the same mold as we design as an abstraction. So every time you add a faculty member to a small school, you somewhat modify and develop and further, uh, and further, uh, there is a further evolution that takes place in the abstract scheme. Uh, in a graduate school, students and other faculty members essentially come to work with people. A student coming to a graduate school works not with an abstract concept. That serves as a, f as a framework for organizing discourse, as a framework for expressing something, but in practice you come to work with persons and that becomes as important as the formal curriculum, especially in a school when so much of our work is outside of class. Because we're working with our students, we're collaborating with them on research, we're working with them a great deal on their papers as, as editors, as critics, as collaborators, and uh, therefore the personal element of what each individual represents, the unique combination of each individual, I would say, is as important as the abstract framework of the curriculum. You made a statement which I thought was very much in line with what you're talking about, and I was wondering if you could, I'll read you the statement, then if you could apply it to how you search out yes. other faculty in the university. Uh, and it was, the boundaries should be, in reference to a curriculum, the boundaries should be flexible and loose, the core should be coherent. Uh, with that in mind, how do you draw in other outside faculty from the university to participate in the uh, graduate program? 
Well, I think that makes it uh, that makes it very easy. Uh, what that means is that we don't worry about the boundaries of our activity. Uh, we want to be sure that that our energies are focused on that aspect of communication that is usually on the boundaries or the peripheries of many other fields, but at the center of none, except ours. So then we can go into uh, go to a a faculty member uh, in uh, in uh, let's say the department of economics who has, uh, such as Professor Phillips here, who has, uh, has done a great deal of work and represents a great uh, nationally, internationally distinguished uh, scholar in the economics and legal aspects of communication regulation. And say, well, would you be willing to work with some of our students? Would you be uh, willing to cross-list your course or offer a course from time to time that our students can take? Uh, this is good for them, it's good for us, it relieves us of, of, the, of the need uh, to have every discipline represented in our program. As it is, we have at least three or four. <coughs> and at the same time makes available to, to uh, us the, the services and the contributions of the best qualified people in the university and makes available to them interested and talented students. Who are, who are, who are uh, training to be scholars, yes. Would you talk about that there was a lot of research is being done outside, outside the school. Can you talk to us about some of this research that takes the student outside the University of Pennsylvania, for instance, Washington, D.C., some of the research that you do? Yes. Well, communication is, is by its very nature, uh, not tied to any one location. It is regional, it is national, it is international. Uh, uh, much of our work uh, that has to do with policy is essentially uh, has a national and international focus. So if, if uh, one of our students or faculty members <coughs> is interested in the development, that's a historical development of, of the uh, of uh, uh, telegraphy, telephony, as we have a faculty member interested in just that. Uh, you, she would go to the National Archives, she would spend a lot of time in Washington, she would trace the legislation, uh, she would discover interesting things, which is what happens when a telephone comes into a home. Uh, uh, she would look into the records that are available uh, uh, in certain places, including Washington. You know what happens when a, when a telephone comes into the home. What happens is, right. is what? When the telephone comes to the home, yes. it, opens, opens, it opens you to many, many, many houses. That That's right. Yeah. It opens you not only to, to the whole world of interactions, but if you're a parent, for the first time in human history, your daughter can call people that you don't control. Mm -hmm. So it also, changes the nature of family controls. Because until the telephone, you have a great deal of control over with whom your daughter or son would interact. But once you get a telephone, uh, that uh, control is weakened. So it, it, any kind of new line of communication not only puts people in touch with one another, but by doing that, it changes the, the contours and the controls of human and social behavior. Uh, uh, more, more frequent is a student who wishes to uh, do a study of uh, the development of some policy of communications or telecommunications, which is the new technologies of communication that uh, has to do with regulatory agencies, the FCC, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, Federal Utilities Commission, the, the uh, a variety of government agencies, congressional committees, and so on, uh, private agencies and private uh, 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 firms uh, concentrated in Washington, interested in legislation. And the field work for that is in Washington. The field work for other kinds of uh, communication-oriented work, such as development. Communication development is one of the major problems and goals of developing countries. Developing countries have to build an infrastructure, have to build, build their, 
uh, languages, their unifications, they have to disseminate information about health, about transportation, about the outside world. Uh, that would take a student to do field work in some other countries. Right now we have a, a very wide-ranging research project under the direction of Professor Robert Hornick that conducts evaluation research of development campaigns in some 16 countries, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Our students are all over this, uh, uh, this globe uh, supervising, conducting that kind of research. I myself am involved uh, in a very ambitious project this, w this very week. Some 15 countries in all continents are tape recording, uh, videotaping their national television programs on all national channels. Uh, next week I will be in Moscow training the coders of the Soviet Union to analyze these tapes. Uh, soon thereafter we either go or bring here researchers from about five or six European countries five or six Asian countries, five or six Latin American countries, two or three African countries, all of whom are right now taping these programs. And we will do a comparative study of how different television systems portrayed the world the week of December, uh, uh, December 5 to 11, 1987, which also happened to include in the middle of it the summit meeting between President Reagan and Party Secretary Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. So we will have a dual focus of this project. Uh, one has to do with the total entertainment and news programming. The other has to do with how all these different systems, mm -hmm. including all social systems around the world, study or present the summit uh, to their own people. Uh, this is a kind of research that uh, will take so collaborating faculty members from all these countries as well as some of our students uh, to go to various places to train the local researchers in very systematic and rigorous observation of these tapes mm -hmm. in methods of analysis. And if this round is successful, in a year or so we will conduct some surveys in each of these countries to see how their own television systems contributed to their mentality, their, to their conceptions. Uh, there are a number of other research projects underway. We're a small school, but we're very busy. Uh, that, that, take, that take our students and faculty, uh, that, that represent essentially a kind of a global resource rather than a local resource that uh, uh, we have the opportunity and in many ways the privilege to be. There are other schools comparable to the Edinburgh School of Communication? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. No. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, will, we like to believe that uh, there are not, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, there are not that many graduate schools of communications uh, that, that there should be much duplication. Each graduate school of communications tries to develop certain strengths, certain unique uh, advantages, certain, uh, certain uh, profiles that would draw the students to it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are <coughs> no schools of communications that are not the odd growth of a large undergraduate program that they simply will continue for a year or two, which means that they draw most of their students from their own, uh, from their own undergraduates. So that uh, there are a number of historical circumstances that make our school unique. Finally, the orientation towards scholarship and research means that we're one of the principal trainers of person power for scholarship and research in communications. I wish there were more because the need is much greater than we can supply. The demand is we could graduate 10 times as many students and place them in fairly good positions. And one of my frustrations is that more people, I mean, we try to promote and and propagate this idea, but uh, there should be many more people aware of the very attractive career opportunities mm -hmm. that exist in this field, which is not what they think. They think that the career opportunities are in journalism and broadcasting and working in the media. Mm -hmm. In fact, that is not so. The more some communication uh, 
uh, process is mechanized, the fewer people it takes to run it. And yet the more pervasive it becomes in every, every, everyone's life. So people think that because television is in every home, because newspapers are read all over, therefore it takes millions of people to run it. That is not so. Uh, there is no great demand for additional uh, uh, jobs, for additional workers in the media. They basically maintain uh, their personnel and whenever they can, like with mergers and acquisitions, they cut back on the people while at the same time they maintain or increase their scope and their penetration. Uh, furthermore, there are very few jobs in media production work that require uh, advanced education and research training. But they, they require brains, a good, a good uh, enterprising ability, usually good writing ability, uh, a sound liberal arts education in uh, humanities and social sciences, and then to be trained on the job. Uh, we, ha we have happened to recognize this uh, very early, so we got into a position of, of some leadership in that sense. Our closest uh, competitors are the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Southern California, mm -hmm. uh, which although at USC there is journalism, there is speech, there is radio, television, there is film, so they're in an environment in which there is much more competition within the university in communications. They still have a fairly unique profile in, mostly in communications management, and attract from that Los Angeles area uh, a sufficient number of people in that. The, the others are Stanford University that has a uh, an Institute of communi for Communication Research and Communication Department of long-standing and good reputation, University of Illinois, uh, University of uh, 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 Indiana, University of uh, Michigan, and Michigan State, Syracuse, Boston University. These are really the handful of well-known Emerson College, new and up-and-coming communication uh, institution in, in Boston. These are basically a handful of well-known graduate schools. Each of them has a somewhat different profile so that if a candidate or an applicant for graduate school in communications really knows what he or she wants, chances are that choice is reduced to maybe one or two schools. Do you limit your enrollment here? But you had a limit in how many you, you, uh, you <coughs> Of course, well, we, we certainly do. We are a small school. We have only 12 uh, uh, faculty members. We have a limited amount of space. And we limit our acceptances to the most brilliant, most talented, most capable of the hundreds of people who apply to us. Mm -hmm. We admit about between 30 and 35 students a year. Mm -hmm. We get about roughly 10 times as many applications. Mm -hmm. So it remains small and very exclusive? Uh, it has to. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, small in, in terms of, of a department or a school. We, we are the size of a small department, mm -hmm. and certainly we are the smallest school of the university. Mm -hmm. uh, exclusive only in the sense that, that uh, the applicants to our program are very uh, uh, searchingly examined. There is a faculty committee uh, that looks at all the applications. At least two members of the committee has to, has to review and rate each application on about seven or eight criteria. Then these ratings are sum summarized, averaged, then all the applicants are ranked according to uh, this average. Then there is a marathon meeting of the committee, mm -hmm. at which time every applicant is discussed and the ranking is adjusted if there seems to be some need to adjust it. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the offers of admission go from the top and the offers of financial aid uh, are then a portion of those who are offered admission, the top part of those uh, who are offered ad admission. Mm -hmm. We're also fortunate in having a very large percentage of our students 
uh, both eligible and uh, and uh, able to receive financial aid because of the amount of financial aid that we can provide. I'm, in I'm interested in uh, the Annenberg Center. Uh, it was built after you had come here. I understand that you oversaw the building of it and that there was a real close connection at one point between the school and the yes. center. Yes. Um, that doesn't seem to exist anymore. That's right. Can you talk a little bit about well, for one thing, uh, the art seminars and the things that would have been called radio, television, and film, it seems as if you made a conscious effort to exclude them at the beginning when you first got here. Uh, by about, then the building of the center would seem to almost contradict it, only because it would not fit into your perspective of what communication studies is. So, uh, it's built. It's just about the best in the city, they say. Can you talk about the idea for building it, and then why the connection uh, was severed. Yes, uh, the, the various aspects that you mentioned are really unrelated historical accidents. They, uh, to start with, they, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, radio, television, film, graphics, and writing labs when I came here. These were established because they really didn't know what to do. Uh, it turned out that none of these labs trained professionals and uh, uh, those people that they did train could find no jobs. Uh, and, and the demand for them declined. So uh, although we do have a film lab now, and we do have a television lab, the two labs that have survived, they're essentially research and exploratory opportunities. They're not vocational or professional training. They serve two purposes. One is to, uh, to uh, uh, explore and experiment with innovative ideas in those media, in those media, and other. The other is to inform those of our students uh, who are otherwise learning research of what it takes to be to 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 satisfy the the creative and technical requirements of working in a medium such as video or television, so that they have an appreciation for that when they do research on it. They. Uh, existence of the center and the, the establishment of the center had nothing to do with these labs. It was quite independent of it. The university uh, had no performing arts, no really suitable and attractive performing arts space. Uh, it had no theater program. There was music, music department and music programs that lacked performance space. And at one point a committee was established to explore the needs of the university and the prospects of fundraising for uh, five minutes the aspects uh, the prospects of fundraising uh, for to, to meet those needs and I happened to be appointed to that committee coincidentally after about a year of serving on that committee uh, it occurred to me and to uh, to mr. Annenberg at the same time that uh, this may be a need uh, that he would be interested in filling. So uh, I think it was Craig Sweeten, who was the head of development at that time, who at my suggestion made a telephone call to, to Walter Annenberg, and uh, 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 Mr. Annenberg said, yes, indeed, I, I think this is something that I recognize, I would be interested in, in, uh, in doing, uh, in, in uh, discussing with the university a major grant to that effect. And uh, uh, either Mr. Annenberg or his associate, uh, uh, Joseph First, called me and said, do you think that a, an art center uh, would fit into the Annenberg School of Communications as it, is, as it is now constituted? And I said, well, I happen to be serving on this university committee. I don't think it would fit the school because the school's approach and the school's need is really more social science than artistic production, but I think the university uh, needs it, so I hope that you'll call the president of the university and say that you're, uh, you're uh, willing to consider making a grant or a gift. Uh, a few days later, Craig Sweden called me back and said, George, you know, something happened, the deal is off. I, I don't understand why, uh, what's wrong. So then I reconstructed the sequence of events, and in talking further, with Joe first, I realized what had happened. The Annenberg School money has to come through the school. That's where the money is. 
not aside from the school. The school, as I suggested earlier, cannot be a conduit of monies to the university. So the only way that this could come about was if I can see my way and our faculty to seeing it as part of the school. So instead of standing on, on, on abstract principle, we said, yes, I, I guess, uh, I, I think we can make it uh, come about and uh, set up, a, at, at that point, uh, we already had a, uh, the laboratory situation and we said, well, we just add a theater lab and a few other things and we can rationalize it. So in that way, we made it possible for the university to get a seven, eight million dollar gift, they would cost three times as much today, uh, to establish the center. We ran it for about two years. There was a showcase for Harold Prince and Joe Papp. They had their companies uh, down here. And after a period of two years, we said, we have done it. This is what, uh, this is what we agreed to do. It, it now uh, is, is going to become a gift to the university uh, and let the and let the university run it because it cannot draw on our resources anymore. Can we continue this tomorrow? Okay. Thank you. All right, let's see if we can reproduce this image. Barely gone. Okay, there was one area we didn't touch about the students. Uh, so how was, when you came, you came as, a, as the dean, uh, how was the student body? How many students uh, were here? Can I just pause this a second? Uh, we have a plant growing on it. Sure. So, so yesterday we covered the uh, formation of the, of, the, of the school and the recruitment of the faculty. Today we're going to talk about the students. Uh, when you first came in, how many students were already? There were maybe a, a dozen or fifteen students. It was the first uh, crop of students, and uh, since the faculty didn't know exactly what they were going to do, mm -hmm. the students didn't know exactly what they're here for, mm -hmm. except that they were generally attracted by Gilbert Seldes's name and fame, mm -hmm. and uh, felt that they wanted to work in the media or be media critics. Uh, the center of the program at that time was a set of media workshops that uh, were not designed to be professional training, as we never were, uh, but uh, they were not, they were not uh, uh, research, they were not research opportunities either. I'm going to stop uh, because I was hoping that my secretary would pick up that. So the, uh, the media uh, laboratories or the, the media, media workshops as they call them uh, uh, is where most of the students spend most of the time. They really didn't uh, uh, know what to do and uh, they were very bright and talented students uh, who came here because they were attracted by Gilbert Seldes's name and fame. Mm -hmm. the, day, uh, the, the students that came from uh, how how the school started to uh, to make themselves known that the school existed, that the program existed. How did it come about to recruit students? Well, th this is a cost constant problem of promotion. You have to promote a program. This is like promoting any institution or, in fact, any product. Mm -hmm. The first step in promotion is to have a good product. Mm -hmm. They. Uh, first requirement of having a good product in a school is to have a good faculty. So as we, as we began to attract and appoint uh, faculty members who were known, who had published, who had done work that was widely recognized, uh, whose uh, names and uh, joining this program in itself constituted news, at least in the academic community, uh, that began to focus attention. Uh, then uh, you you uh, uh, you put out a good-looking bulletin. You you buy up uh, lists. Uh, you advertise. Uh, you appear in the various graduate student guides. Uh, all of which creates an environment in which, as alumni go out, uh, as faculty go around the country and speak, as uh, they publish, uh, it uh, it begins to uh, to uh, establish 
the image and the name and the special interest of the school and it begins to attract students who, uh, who begin to understand what the school is all about and not are attracted only by the word communication which means many things to many people and not only attracted by the impression that it is different from many things that maybe they don't want, in other words, not by, by default and not by negative reasons, but by actually wanting to study with the people who are here, which means want to work in the same general perspective and on the same general kinds of problems. So a constant promotion, it never ends. We are, we are at, at it, uh, it began and uh, we, we have to do every year uh, because uh, for a school like this, even though we're a small school, it takes a very large global pool of potential applicants to be able to be selective and we're highly selective. By the way, among the student body, are they uh, coming, uh, foreigners coming here to study at the, at the school? Yes, there is, a, there is an increasing number uh, of uh, uh, global clientele. Uh, this year, uh, of the entering class, about 60% come out from outside the United States. They come from all over the world, and there is only one country uh, from which we have more than two. Mm -hmm. Wh what do you think that country is? More than two? More than two. In other words, 60% of the entering class comes from outside the United States. Yeah. They come from all over the world. There's no more than two from any one country except one. What's the largest, most populous country in the world? China. China. Mm -hmm. That's right. But I didn't think China because When did you begin the undergraduate program and how is it coming? The uh, undergraduate program uh, began perhaps, uh, well, it, it began in several stages. The so-called 500 courses of the graduate program have always been uh, available to selected undergraduates. There are 400 level courses that are primarily undergraduates, but they also confer graduate credit for selected graduate students. We've had a number of 500 courses all along because we felt that the more talented and interested undergraduates should be able to test and try communications uh, courses for which there are no prerequisites, for which there are no prior training, but uh, just uh, good ability is, is needed. Uh, then uh, it became evident that the handful of people who could be accommodated, the handful of undergraduates who could be accommodated in a few 500 level graduate courses did not satisfy the need and the demand. And uh, since we were graduating people in the graduate program who went to many other universities and colleges starting and developing undergraduate programs, it became uh, clear that we should make a contribution to our own university in terms of a graduate or an undergraduate program. However, the Annenberg School of Communications is a graduate school. We are chartered as a graduate school and uh, we do not and our faculty did not propose to start an undergraduate program in the Annenberg School. We proposed to the college, now the School of Arts and Sciences, to have an undergraduate major. Uh, after a few years of uh, negotiations or a few years of really consideration, uh, they agreed to have a, uh, a major uh, in which the admission is somewhat limited. And that opened the way to the offering of a fairly large number of courses that are now taken by between three and 500 undergraduates each semester that are taught by our faculty that uh, uh, lead to a communications degree, a liberal arts communications degree in the School of Arts and Sciences. And even though many undergraduates think that they are getting an Edinburgh School degree, in fact, uh, it is not an Edinburgh School degree. It's, a, it's a, an SAS degree mm -hmm. taught uh, mostly by members of our faculty. We find that, and I personally find that undergraduate teaching is very exciting. It, it has many features that graduate teaching lacks. Mm -hmm. You can pontificate a little more. You can expose and express, uh, and uh, you, you, 
it's, it's less a seminar situation in which you really just kind of pool resources. Uh, and I think that most of our faculty appreciate the, the uh, challenge of teaching people who come to, into a class with no preconceptions, with no knowledge of really what they're getting into or of the professors who've never heard of them, and who in effect uh, have the attitude, well, show me why I should study this in the first place. That is a challenge that I think every teacher uh, ought to have because too often we take too much for granted that what we teach ought to be taught, that it is really useful, that it is really useful and practical and people can make some use out of it instead of just being required or offered and to have to justify and motivate what you do to a person who, uh, who is not yet committed. I think that is the challenge of undergraduate teaching. Do you, uh, do you encourage or some of these undergraduate uh, students that go into the master, they apply here at the school? Well, yes and no. We, we very much would like to get the cream of the crop uh, of Pennsylvania students who are interested in uh, a graduate communications program uh, to uh, apply. We do not encourage them to be an undergraduate communications major. Uh, the undergraduate communications major is designed to uh, be a general education liberal arts major. We think it's useful for any student because essentially what it, what it does is to, to inform and equip a student to uh, be a civilized citizen who has some understanding of communications practices and some understanding of the symbolic environment uh, created mostly by mass media in which, into which um, all children today are born and in which we grow up and in which we learn so as to uh, instead of simply absorbing and taking for granted uh, this whole uh, communication environment to, to, to take a, a little more analytical and critical and uh, detached uh, point of view and thereby become more self-directing. This is something that we feel all educated people in modern society must know something about and we think it should be taught on every level from kindergarten through college. Uh, when a, once a, a communications undergraduate major has taken most of those courses, that person has taken uh, many of our, has had courses from many of our professors, has had, uh, has in effect specialized at the conclusion of his or her undergraduate career in communications, uh, which we don't think is the best preparation for being a communications graduate student. The best preparation for being a communications graduate student is to take full advantage of the broadest possible preparation in the humanities and social sciences because that student is going to specialize anyway. We think that to, to be specialized as an undergraduate student is too soon if you're going to pursue that specialization in graduate school. This is very different from engineering or medicine where there is or law, where there is pre-law and pre-engineering and pre-medicine, pre and I don't think that's a good idea. I think that the undergraduate education should be very broad because this is the student's last chance to encounter history and philosophy and the humanities and the social sciences, uh, especially or perhaps particularly when a student is going to go on to graduate school. So I'm not saying that an undergraduate who is going to terminate with a a uh, bachelor's degree should not have some specialty. But an undergraduate who is going to go on into a highly specialized area should not specialize, should not waste that person's final opportunity to be as broad as possible. We feel that that's good for their preparation because as communication students, uh, while they'll be specializing in methodology, they'll be specializing in some area of either codes and modes or interpersonal or mass or institutional or some other f uh, area of the, of the field, they have to tackle problems that come out of life and society and history and philosophy and uh, uh, social science. And if they're not broadly knowledgeable, they will be very limited. Their scope, their vision, their horizons will be too limited <coughs> to, to come up with um, a sufficiently wide variety of good problems.
Do you think that uh, an undergrad with a major in communication, what job opportunities the school that they might have when they think? A an undergraduate major in communications is not a not a professionally or vocationally trained individual. Mm -hmm. An undergraduate major in anything mm -hmm. is not a professionally trained individual. Mm -hmm. In that, uh, it's uh, it's trained maybe for life, but not for a job. In most uh, universities, certainly in, in most liberal arts colleges, uh, the purpose of undergraduate education is to really find out what is known. Mm -hmm. The purpose of graduate education is to be professionally trained to tackle what is not known. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's not the way. Uh, you spend that time you'd want to spend yes. Oh, yes, of course. Um, because you have to. One thing, uh, this is, uh, you are mm -hmm. referred to as the dean with an eye on television. Could you explain why they refer to you as the dean with an eye on television? Well, ask them who, you uh, no, who no, make no, that no, reference. <laughs> It has to do with your research on, on, on the media. Well, I am essentially a communications researcher, mm -hmm. and uh, most, but not all, of my research of the last 10, 15 years has been on television, not exclusively, but this has been the most visible, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I feel that television is very different from other media. Mm -hmm. Television uh, comes into the home, uh, for the first time in human history, it presents a steady environment of seven, uh, average of seven and a half hours a day in every home. Uh, people don't select it out. People are born into it. They grow up with it. And by the time they get to be five or six years old, they will have absorbed uh, many thousands, tens of thousands of hours of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But it is not storytelling by the parent, by the church, by the school, by the neighborhood. It is storytelling by a group of distant corporations who have uh, other motives uh, to, to tell you stories than what we often recognize, which is why I think we have to be aware and much more analytical about these stories, and that uh, therefore it is comparable to a new religion, not to another medium. It's a total symbolic environment that includes art, science, government, every all parts of knowledge, uh, and that is steady, it is consistent, it is repetitive, and it is used as a ritual. Mm -hmm. It's a religion that most people attend to much more religiously than they have attended to any religion that ever existed. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling about, uh, about television as something entirely new, in, uh, uh, that as, as ushering in a new historical epoch, mm -hmm. and something that, that deserves serious study. Um, do you, there is something, um if we have the time, we come back. You have uh, very much uh, involved with the National Institute of Health that you have some grants. Oh, we're very much involved with anybody who will give us money. How do you, how do That's you establish all. that relationship? We ask for grants. We, uh, they're simply uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Office of Telecommunications Policy, the American Medical Association, mm -hmm. the Administration on Aging, uh, International Research and Exchanges Board. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate in never, in never being without a grant for the last 35 years. How do you manage to do that? It's called grantsmanship. Pardon? <laughs> it's called grantsmanship. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, uh, it's good luck, I suppose, but also hard work and, and uh, trying to uh, write proposals that address problems that persuade enough people with money or institutions with funds to give that it's, it's worth uh, supporting. Mm -hmm. Then after a while you get a certain track record that, uh, that has its own momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's much easier, uh, although I must say it's getting to be more difficult because uh, uh, social research uh, grant funds are drying up. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've had no, uh, our, our close association with these institutions uh, was by virtue of an umbilical cord mm -hmm. called money. Money, but uh, to get to know where it is, you have to know where the money is. So, so that means I guess the right contacts, no? No, it's part of uh, academic life to be able to do the research. There are mm -hmm. foundation directories where we constantly look look over them. Mm -hmm. We're always doing research on uh, what foundations and organizations and uh, uh, 
um, institutes of government uh, and so on are interested in supporting what kind of endeavor in research or what they might find useful. And uh, uh, this is a, a constant uh, preoccupation. It's not, a, it's not a question of contact. Mm -hmm. It's a question of, uh, of knowing uh, where to apply, to whom to apply, and how to write good applications. Right. Mm -hmm. the, for instance, the last one, you are involved with, you are going to be uh, traveling to one of my five countries, you are going to be you're tra going to Russia. And how that project came about, the last project that you are involved? Well, I'm, very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of te telling you because of, you. Uh, I will be incriminating myself uh, because uh, uh, that uh, I've been working for at least 10 years in saying that uh, what I say about television and uh, the way in which a country arranges its own television system, which, uh, which is what I call the mass-produced universal symbolic environment in which children grow up and in which all of us live and die cannot be understood in isolation. In order to understand what we have, we have to compare it to other systems. A fish in the ocean doesn't know that it's swimming in salt water until it's pulled out or until it gets into to fresh water or otherwise has some kind of a basis for comparison. So I've been agitating and promoting um, for many years, uh, at least 10 years, maybe maybe 20, I forget now how long, uh, the idea of doing cross-cultural comparative studies. Well, uh, this was done by means of applications, by means of establishing contacts in, in many countries. Little by little, we build up collegial relationships. Uh, we have uh, been able to do that now in a sufficient number of countries. and. Uh, uh, about a year ago, we received a grant by the uh, W. Alton Jones Foundation of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, by virtue of uh, the good offices and, and the talent of our partner in this, Professor Ellen Mitskiewicz, Professor of Political Science in Emory University, who, uh, whom we are joining in this, in this enterprise who made the initial contact, mm -hmm. uh, to do a Soviet-American comparative study. Mm -hmm. So we had that money. Then we started to work with our so Soviet counterparts and uh, with the bureaucracy mm -hmm. uh, in Moscow, which is very cautious and very slow moving. Mm -hmm. We finally uh, worked our way through that and got the permissions and just got the tickets yesterday. You know, everything happens a long time, nothing happens, and then everything happens the last minute. Uh, and when I knew that this was already set and we had the funding, then I started to put together similar arrangements in all the other countries. Mm -hmm. So now we have England, France, Italy, mm -hmm. Finland, Hungary, mm -hmm. we have China, Indonesia, uh, uh, Taiwan, Korea. Mm -hmm. We have, Ni we have uh, Nigeria, two or three countries in, in Africa, uh, two or three countries in the Middle East, uh, at least 15 countries, all taping the same week, this week. Now all these, tape, these videotape machines are running, I hope. <laughs> uh, now, um, in the meantime, we have developed a, a coding and analysis scheme, a way of, of uh, uh, screening these tapes and of analyzing. Mm -hmm. We're going to Moscow to discuss the scheme with our counterparts mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union and to train them on the basis of what we agree because we have had a lot of experience in this having done the American part of the study mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we'll be training them and uh, training ourselves at the same time as to how to apply this. Mm -hmm. Once we have that experience, then we will organize similar workshops for all the other teams. Mm -hmm. So they'll all be doing the analysis either, either at home, locally, or here mm -hmm. uh, uh, by the same methodology, so we'll be able to compare it. Mm -hmm. When that is done, and some of it even while that analysis is being done, we will have a series of interviews in each country with the decision makers in the television system to find out a little more about what's behind, what are the policies behind the programs, and what are the objectives of each system. 
for the first time we will be able to test the objectives mm -hmm. because nobody has really tested it. All television systems and television uh, program directions are based on a combination of political and economic assumptions. Mm -hmm. Now when they're economic there is a good test of that, it's in the box office and sales. But when it's political, when it's cultural, uh, the testing is very difficult. We are saying, okay, these are your policies. You will see what the product is in terms of images, and then we want to see what the product is in terms of the mentality and the conceptions of people about life and reality. So that the, the total scope of the project has three steps. The investigation of policies, the investigation of the actual content that appears on the screens, and then the investigation of the contribution, that long-term exposure to those patterns of content make to people's thinking about themselves and about their lives and about their society, and to see how well, if at all, those conceptions reflect the goals and the policies that the decision makers in each system think they are pursuing. So you can see that it's a complex uh, enterprise. We have all these countries involved, and uh, I feel like the sorcerer's apprentice. I suppose you know the story about the sorcerer's apprentice who found the magic word by which, instead of his having to go to the well and bring every bucket of water into the house, he commanded the bucket to go on its own and keep bringing waters in. Mm -hmm. But he forgot how to call it off. So the bucket kept going back and forth until there was a flood. Right now we have a flood of, <laughs> of these tapes and of these countries, and I still have to find the magic formula uh, and the money uh, to do the actual analysis. I trust, I'm fairly confident that having this opportunity to organize it, that it is of sufficient value to a sufficient number of organizations in the United States and in the other countries to be able to fund it, but that still remains to be seen. You see, entrepreneurship in, in academic life, as in your business and any other business, uh, has great opportunities. It also has certain risks. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you don't take the risk, you don't, you don't go nowhere. That's right. How did the networks regard your work? Well, the networks don't like anybody uh, uh, snooping uh, and uh, testing and uh, 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 inquiring into their business. No, no organization does. When we came up with findings that they like, they love it. When we came up with findings that, that, that they think could be used against them as a bad for their public relations or bad for their... their uh, uh, reputation or bad for their their sponsors or bad for their political chances in Congress uh, then uh, then they don't like it then they uh, try to attack it or undermine it you know, then they send their representatives to give talks about uh, uh, about uh, how invalid or flawed our methodology is but that's what network research departments are for they're essentially defensive organizations, they're interested in how to defend the corporation in the public arena from criticism. They've never replicated it. Uh, I've told them that if they want to know whether our methods are valid or not, it's very simple. They should repeat it. But that's risky because maybe they come up with the same results, so they never do it. What they do is, and they never even take seriously our reports. What they do is they look at headlines, they look at publicity, they look at newspaper stories, and very often when newspaper stories report what we do in a very superficial way, they simply respond to that. They're not interested in the scientific, by and large, they're not interested in the scientific uh, arguments that are going on, uh, which are many. Now, when I say they, I think that's a, that's a, a a, an unwarranted generalization. We have colleagues among network researchers who know their business very well and um, uh, who know much more than what they say or what they report, but who are all 
also employees of a network and they can't and they and they can't really report what they know they have to report only that portion of what they know that can be considered a defensive operation that's the difference between <coughs> a researcher or an executive or a public relations person employed by a corporation and by a university we have what we call academic freedom we can let the chips fall where they may more or less uh, and uh, we are reasonably protected in our jobs but if I were to tell a, uh, a corporation that hires me not an educational corporation but a business corporation that hires me well I've just done a study and, and I'm terribly sorry but I think you should go out of business because what you do is bad for people I don't think they'd go out of business I would go out of business mm -hmm. do you see I mean uh, have you seen since you start uh, do, uh, doing some criticism on the, on, on, on the media any change any that has to, um, any impact to research on them? yes the, well programs? yes and no the, the question is what kind of impact can you expect right. they what the media portray are are reflections of social relationships, of institutional relationships, of basic social values of who are the majorities and who are the minorities, where the power lies. That is not arbitrary. That reflects the real power structure of a society. Mm -hmm. The question is, you can't expect that uh, to change until or unless society changes. Mm -hmm. uh, when society, if and when society changes, then that will change too and will reflect a new set of social relations. So you have to uh, think about what kind of change is reasonable to expect under the circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of change cannot take place without first changing other circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to be done on both of these scores. There is a lot of change that can take place within existing circumstances because they're not fully utilized and very often the networks uh, are either very timid and networks broadcasters very timid or lazy uh, or take shortcuts and they don't realize that they can enrich and diversify their programming without too much additional cost and without any loss of commercial value so to, to that extent I think uh, we can be helpful and, and point out to them that there are a number of things that they're simply not doing mm -hmm. that they could be doing there have been a number of significant changes uh, in terms of health-related habits. Tobacco is off the air. Uh, hard liquor is off the air. Uh, there are certain considerations now about sexism that would be too blatant, and we have been we have been we have been working on that for a long time. There are certain expressions of racism that are too blatant. There are many other expressions that are not so blatant that are still that you can still find embedded in the program. So there's been uh, a, a certain amount of consciousness raising that uh, broadcasters today and many things that they don't do that they used to do without even being aware of it say 20 years ago then there are other kinds of changes that they could not do without losing money and you can't ask people who are by and large are people of talent and integrity uh, that uh, you should do good things because uh, I think they're good even if you lose your shirt then you have to begin to start thinking as a citizen. Say, how can we provide the resources for these professionals who are talented and who are persons of integrity and who would like to do the best they know how to do but can't mm -hmm. because they can't afford it? Mm -hmm. How can you provide resources? At that point, you become a citizen, mm -hmm. not just a researcher, and say there has to be, uh, we have to make some provisions. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we think television is free, but there's no, no such thing as a free good. Television costs an average American household about $100 a year, mm -hmm. which is a little more than the average household in Britain pays for a television license. Mm -hmm. But that money is collected through the price of products we buy mm -hmm. and goes into advertising that is paid, paid to the broadcasters. So it's a form of taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. And you begin to think, what are other ways of allocating resources so that the networks and the broadcasters and the publishers and everybody else can afford to serve a number of important social goals without losing money. Mm -hmm. At that point, as I said, you're talking about policy, you're talking about politics, mm -hmm. and uh, you're talking about citizenship mm -hmm. rather than only communications. Yeah. Thank you. Could you uh, briefly describe, we've talked a little bit about it, we haven't called it, but it is. Could you 
briefly describe the Cultural Indicators Project? The Cultural Indicators Project is a three-step attempt <coughs> to provide some indicators of central trends in modern cultural life. Central trends usually means television. It doesn't always have to, but under, under our circumstances, it means television because that is the only instrument that is used relatively non-selectively, that pervades almost every home, and that is used across the board by children, uh, adults, old people, provincial people out in the sticks. Nobody's out in the sticks anymore if you have a television set. Mentally, you're in with the mainstream, so that it's the universal, most pervasive instrument. Given that, and given the concept that it's like uh, more like a, a civilization, like a religion, not like just another medium, the three steps of the project are the investigation of policy, how policies are made in different countries, in different societies, in different social systems, to decide what should be the universal curriculum of all the people, which is what we think television is. Second, what is the content? I call it the message systems. What systems of messages are produced and mass produced to the specifications determined by those decision makers? And the third is what we call cultivation. What kind of mentality, what kind of conceptions about life and reality does each system of messages cultivate among its own viewers? Finally, the international aspect that we're getting involved very deeply right now uh, suggests that we can't measure, we can't understand the kind of mentality and the kind of outlook and perspective that our system cultivates in us without comparing it to other social systems in other countries, in, uh, in other systems, uh, to see uh, whether uh, we are reaching our objectives any better than they are, whether they are doing certain things that we could use, and vice versa, whether they are doing certain things or they could be using certain things to achieve their aims by learning from what we are doing. So it's not a, just a direct comparison between what the Russians have, what we have, or what the, what the Chinese have and what we have. It's a comparison between how well they achieve their aims which may not be our aims, compared to how well we achieve our aims and how could each society achieve its own, own aims and understand its own systems and its own dynamics better by looking at the same process around the world. In television, uh, you can't experiment with it. Our experiment is the globe, is the world. Our laboratory is the world. Our only experimentation is cross-cultural because you can't control it, you can't invent it, but you can learn and, and decide and, I guess, develop ways of making decisions, ways of being more analytical as viewers, and ways of being more uh, sensitive as producers. Well, because I would like to... I would like to ask you a question. Um, I would like to talk about your personal personal history, really. but before we go that, because we can interrupt any time, uh, how would you like to be remembered, uh, Professor Werner? How would you like to be remembered? If at all. Mm. How would you like to be remembered? Or, in other words, what do you think has been the, your biggest contribution? Well, that's not up to me to say. I think my, whatever it is, I feel that it's yet to be made. Oh, you're still here on it? Yes. Okay, no problem. Um, when, um, could you tell us your experience before you came to, uh, to the United States? I, uh, I was born and raised in Hungary. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the 1930s in Budapest. Uh, my father was a teacher, my, my mother was a photographer, and uh, later on uh, went into the uh, dress design business. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, most lasting and important experience uh, as a child was, w as, as a child, as an adolescent, was with fascism. I grew up in a country in which uh, fascism existed in a kind of parliamentary uh, disguise 
uh, but uh, soon it became allied with Germany and uh, um, I had one year at the university. Mm -hmm. I became accepted to the university essentially by accident. Uh, I had always been interested in folklore. I used to spend my summers in the villages going uh, around and collecting folk tales, folk songs, folk music. I learned to play the zither mm -hmm. and in literature. And I was sent by my high school to a national uh, literary competition and I happened to win first prize in 1938. And so uh, I, uh, this had to be admitted to the university because I became a kind of minor celebrity. I had one year at the university or before the year was up I was about to be drafted into the Hungarian army. And I decided that that's not the army I want to be drafted into, so I left. Without any money or without, without much, much help, uh, although I found people who helped me, I went to Mexico. I was in Mexico for six months, I was in Cuba. See? See? See. Oh, so you had a contact in Mexico? No, I didn't have a contact. I, you just landed in Mexico? I just landed in, in, in Mexico, I landed in Veracruz, and uh, then um, I went to Mexico City. Uh, I had a half-brother who lived in Hollywood and who had been in Mexico and who had some friends and who put me in touch with some friends and who sent me some, some help. Mm -hmm. But after about two weeks in Mexico, I became a guide to American tourists. That's about all you need. When American tourists come down and know nothing, you have a two weeks advantage of them, that's about all you need. So I specialized in, in uh, I, I, I stayed at uh, Ponzio, at the little uh, a guest house called Casa Arenal, mm -hmm. Calle Paris Siete, it was the address, mm -hmm. uh, where mostly American school teachers came down, they drove down in their cars and they stayed there. It's a relatively uh, low priced, uh, uh, easily affordable place and I specialized in out of the way places mm -hmm. because I didn't know what, uh, I didn't know what uh, <laughs> Uh, what anything else was, so I would take, uh, I would go go with them in their cars and would 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 uh, uh, essentially escort them and and help them to get around. And after a while, I learned uh, enough about the small villages where no tourists ever went, where you could get uh, you could get uh, three meals and and a nice lodging for a little more than a dollar. It was enormously interesting, was very good, and was very cheap. So I I became a specialist in it. At any rate, uh, after six months in uh, uh, after six months uh, in Mexico, my visa, which was a, which was a tourist visa, that's all I could get. I got that in Paris. Uh, that's all I could get. It expired, and so I was about to be deported and uh, went to Cuba, uh, where I had no real visa. And they, by that time, the war had broken out in Europe. This was 1939. What made you go to Cuba? Uh, I suppose that was the only place that I could go to. I, I didn't have many choices. I came, uh, I, I landed in Cuba before going to Mexico. No, I think that's right. Uh, I had been admitted to UCLA as a student, but I, I couldn't get here, bec I couldn't come to the United States because I wasn't given a visa and I was not an immigrant. And uh, uh, a little known fact of American immigration policy is that if you're not an immigrant and if you don't have a visa, you cannot come in from an adjoining country, from Canada or Mexico. You must go to a third country, separated by water, and there obtain a visa because you have no business around the border. This is to try to uh, prevent people, uh, I mean people who otherwise don't know the ropes and don't know how to do it, uh, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, to sneak across the border. So I went to Cuba. Uh, this is going to be a long story and we don't have time. I'm, I'm, going, to, okay. I'm going to speed it up a little bit, okay? Uh, uh, I was given a temporary visa. I landed in New Orleans. Uh, they took me off the ship and deported me because I didn't have enough money. Another little known fact of American immigration policy is that if you have no money and if you have no affidavit some of su uh, support, you're not going to be allowed in. Uh, I uh, appealed this verdict. It was sent to Washington. I was allowed to stay there for two weeks. My half-brother made some arrangements 
some people invited me into their homes, mm -hmm. into their home. Mm -hmm. It happened to be the director of the theater in, in uh, New Orleans who had another house guest mm -hmm. whose name was Sinclair Lewis. So the mm -hmm. first day uh, upon arrival in the United States, I was a house guest uh, with Sinclair Lewis, all of whose books I had read in Hungary, mm -hmm. and it was a terrific experience. Soon after that, I went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. After one semester, I decided I want to major in journalism, went to Berkeley. I graduated in journalism. I worked on the San Francisco Chronicle. At that point, another little known fact of American history is that Hungary had become an enemy country because Hungary attacked uh, the United States, uh, declared war on the United States. I was classified as an enemy alien. But by 1943, the American army needed people enough that they didn't worry so much, and they allowed me to join the army. I was joined the army. I, was, I volunteered for the parachutes. I went to Africa. I jumped. In, I went to Europe. I jumped in Yugoslavia behind the lines. I was with the partisans uh, from the from about January until May of 1945. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, because if the war had lasted longer, I would have never gotten out. Mm -hmm. uh, I got out when the, when the war was over. I was sent within three days of VE Day uh, to do war criminal work b into Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, in Austria, I arrested the prime minister under whom I left Hungary. His general staff, his cabinet, took them all back to war criminal trials. Uh, and uh, after that, everything was a kind of anti-climax. Uh, very few people have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, be able to participate mm -hmm. uh, in events and in kind of poetic justice uh, such as that. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I met my wife. Mm -hmm. I was attached to the American military mission in Budapest shortly after, as part of uh, the war criminal work. These are Hungarian troops that were encamped that had fled from the Russians. Uh, I went to the theater one night, um, as I like, love to do, and, and uh, saw a play uh, with a beautiful actress. And accidentally, a few days later, I met her in a party. And I said, I, I know you. I know, know who you are. And she figured that's a very old line. Why couldn't I come up with something more original? Well, I proved to her that uh, it's true and sat down beside her and have been sitting there ever since. Uh, we, got, we got shortly thereafter, we got married, mm -hmm. went to Vienna. Uh, became a civilian employee of the State Department uh, working on an American newspaper uh, there for the Army. Then we came back and uh, I was looking for another newspaper job, which is what I had left, when on a Thursday an employment agency which with, with which I had been registered called up and said, I, we don't have the job that you really want, but we have a teaching job in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. The journalism instructor just left and they need somebody right away. Could you start on Monday, at least temporarily? And I said, fine, I need a job, mm -hmm. and why not? Mm -hmm. I started teaching on Monday and have been teaching ever since. I discovered that I was really much more interested. I had not given any thought to an academic career mm -hmm. until I accidentally stumbled into a teaching job. Mm -hmm. I discovered that I, I was much more interested in trying to find out the conditions under which people in the media work and how this affects life than being the hired hand of a publisher, which is what I had been as a, as a reporter. It's at that point that I started to do my graduate work on the GI Bill of Rights. If not for the GI Bill of Rights, I would have never been able to afford to be an academic. Mm -hmm. The GI Bill of Rights paid from the first day to the final typing of my, of my doctoral dissertation. I started my graduate work. I chose the university to which I would go as a graduate student by well, I, we lived in Hollywood, and I worked in Pasadena, and I had to find, and I had a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Throughout my whole graduate career, I had a full-time teaching job. Mm -hmm. And I had to find a university that was more or less on the way. Okay. And that happened to be USC, mm -hmm. which was very fortunate. I had a, I had a good time there. Uh, I got uh, uh, within, let's see, this, this was in 1949, uh, 1948, 49. Uh, I got my dissertation by 1954. Along about 1952, 53, we figured that it's too slow. So I made a new, new Year's resolution. And on the 1st of January, I go nowhere, nowhere at all other than a job. I do not go out at night, on weekends, 
12, 13, 14 hours every weekend until it's finished. It was finished by the 1st of September. It was the first time I went out of the house other than, other than to work. And it seems to me that style of life has kept me, has, has served me very well ever since. Uh, went to the, uh, got a job at, at USC where I was a graduate student. Then I was recruited to the University of Illinois mm -hmm. in 1956. I was there until 64. 1964, I came here. Mm -hmm. And that is it in a nutshell. What, uh, what made you decide to step down from the kingship here? It was because of the the policy that you have to be here, ex normal. <laughs> the, poli the policy is that it's six years that can be renewed once. That's the policy. If 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 the university had stuck to the policy, I would have been, I would have been, uh, I would not have been a dean this long. The question is, what made me decide to stay that long? Uh -huh. Not not to uh, not uh, to. What made you no, decide no. to step down? This is. It's not a question of. It's not a question of stepping down. It's uh, the miracle is that I lasted this long. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very complicated situation, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed every minute of it. But uh, uh, 25, it will will be. I will ent be entering my 25th year as a dean. Mm -hmm. Well, that's crazy. No. Yeah. No. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I was able to pursue some of my own work and teach my classes and, and work with my students and do my research and writing and editorial work and so on. Uh, but uh, I have many new projects, including the one I was just talking about. I have, I have writing plans, I have editing work to do, and I think that the school needs and, and the school deserves and I deserve uh, a, a break. Uh, and so it's not that I'm stepping down from anything, I'm stepping up to what I consider to be the next step in my own development and in my own productivity. We have built a school, not I, but the faculty that I help recruit. Mm -hmm. Every time a new faculty member enters, he or she becomes a full partner in, in this enterprise and then, then we go on. We have built a school and uh, that period is over. Now we need to either maintain it or or do something new, do something different, do a, a, a launch on a new direction. That's an all-absorbing task. I've been absorbed long enough. I want to be absorbed now with a number of other projects that to me are, are exciting, new, and uh, to which I am committed, mm -hmm. and which I have great difficulty in pursuing as long as my life is as fragmented as it is now. The thing is that the school is also it's very important to have a very strong dean, a person very dedicated and all that. So I wonder if uh, your successor will have the stamina and the interest that you have. Because it's your personality, you're an entrepreneur, you, you go, you size the opportunities, you are a sales, you know, you go, you are a very a, a marketing genius and all that. Well, thank you very much. What are you doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is uh, true. It is true. Uh, you know, it depends very much and, and going to, to, uh, Look, the, this is a new stage in the development of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came, I was a relatively young man. I was a, an assistant professor. No, I was an associate professor at the University of Illinois. I had tenure, and so I had a stable position. But to me, it was a really an institution building and at the same time a career building proposition. Mm -hmm. That phase is over. Uh, every institution deserves to, <laughs> to take a look at its own direction uh, periodically, and every individual deserves uh, to take a look at its own, uh, and its own direction. And let's hope that whomever they find will be a lot better, a lot more energetic, and a lot more ambitious, and all the things that you've mentioned uh, than, than I could be at this stage. Why not? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we got it all. Good. Thank you. Even your personal.